It says this in Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of person with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Why? For the hearers of the law are just before God. For not the hearers of the law are just before God. But the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, uh -huh. do by nature the things contained in the law, uh -huh. these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, right. which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day, when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now we have studied all of that up until this verse. This is where we ended last week. This today, we begin here. He says this, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident when thou thyself art a guide of the blind, and a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law, thou therefore, which teaches another, teaches thou not thyself. Hmm. Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? Hmm. Hmm. Thou that says a man should not commit adultery. Dost thou commit adultery? Hmm. Thou that abhors idols. <coughs> Dost thou commit sacrilege? Hmm. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Why? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. That is what we're going to pick up this week. Okay? We're going to study that. Here's a reality. All men, whether Jew or Gentile, are in need of the gospel. No matter who they are, no matter where they come from, no matter what their heritage is, they are in need of the gospel. Amen. Amen. 
Now, Paul has determined through his writings in the first chapter that Gentiles, he said, were under the condemnation of God. What he laid out in the first chapter was based off this fact. The Gentiles, anyone that was not a Jew, is in need of the gospel. And he will stand before God one day. He will not be able to make an excuse that he didn't know God because God has given him every opportunity to know who God is. He's given him his word. He's given him everything. He's given him creation. He's never going to be able to stand before God and say, God, I, don't, I didn't know this. It, it, you know, I always think about it like, the TV show with door number one, door number two, and door number three, right? If you had known what was behind door number three, you would have picked door number two. That's right. That's right. So you know what God is doing? God said, this is what I'm doing. I'm giving you the door, but I'm going to give you a secret. Behind door number one is hell. You don't want to go there. Don't pick it. But behind door number two, is eternal life. And I'm going to let you pick it up front. I'm going to tell you right now which door to pick. So you won't be able to stand before him and say, God, I had absolutely no idea what was behind door number two. Because God's letting you know what's behind the door. Yeah. That's right. Our problem is that we just reject the door because we think, I want to live my life the way I want to, and I've got tomorrow. Well, do you? No. No. Paul let them know that God had revealed himself to the Gentile and that if they rejected God's revelation of him, that regardless, they're still going to stand before God and they're going to be without excuse. Why? Because not only God made things that he gave them, but you know what he did? He allowed the members of this church to be witnesses unto him. Yes. To go to the highways and byways and witness to people and share Christ with people. So that you're going to be without excuse. But let's say none of them came to you. You saw the moon every day. You saw the stars at night. You saw the things that I created. You watched the fall come. You saw it snow. You watched all that I made. You saw a caterpillar turn into a butterfly. Absolutely. And you still rejected me? That was your choice. Because yep. I gave you everything you needed yep. while you were on this earth to accept me. And you rejected it. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. So what Paul does next is that he moves to chapter 2. And he determines this. He determined that the Jew, although he stood in judgment of the Gentile, he thought that because of his natural heritage, mm -hmm. that he was better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He did. And he found himself hypocritically mm -hmm. judging the Gentile, that he too was under the, he failed to realize something. He's under condemnation of God just himself. Amen. He looked at the Gentile and thought, you have no idea who we are. We have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You don't have that. Dog. And he judged him, failing to realize that he was under the condemnation of God. And as a result, he was going to stand in the judgment of God himself. So this is what it says in Romans 2, verse 1. It says this. Why don't you wait here? He says, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, Jew, he says, for wherein thou judges another, you're judging Gentiles, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judges, here's the problem, you do the same thing. He says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this old man that judges them would do such things and do it the same, that you're going to escape the judgment of God? You think just because you're, you're a Jew and you stand in judgment of Gentiles that you're going to escape his judgment? Mm -hmm. No. So Paul let the Jews know that they too are under the condemnation of God and Paul overcomes every objection that they could raise to that conclusion. Here was the problem. The Jew honestly believed 
that his Jewishness gave him favor with God. He did. He failed to realize this, that God is not a respecter of person. That was his problem. Paul let them know that God judges, he says, according to truth, according to their works, and judges impartially, and both the moral and religious Jew fails to meet his standard just like the Gentile. He said, all have sinned. You know, when God says all, he means all. We used to have a saying on in my neighborhood. When God says all, that means lottie, dottie, everybody. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way it goes. Paul let them know that God judges according to truth. So now Paul begins to conclude his discussion of the reasons for the guilt of the Jew by reminding them of a fundamental problem that the Jew had, and it was based on the fact of this. They don't obey the law. So it goes here, and look, it says this. I didn't underline where you fill in the blanks, but you'll figure it out. <laughs> there was the need for right of God's righteousness, and he said this, the Jews do not obey, goes in the blank, the law. <coughs> And he gives an access to the, they, because here's the reason, right? The, the reason that they obey, they have access to the truth. And it was confirmed in this truth in verse 17. He says this, picking up in verse 17. No, 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 go back. He says, behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. Oh, they thought they were somebody. He says, and know it, know it as well. And approve the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. You know what Doug Paul does here? He begins this section by explaining to the Jew and proving something to him. That he not only had ready access to the truth, but he also was confirming, confirmed in that truth. Why? Because he had been instructed in the law. Paul said that he rests in the law or that he was settled in the law. Here was the deal. Unlike the Gentile who only had his conscience to guide him, the Jew had been given the law. We had nothing. We had absolutely nothing. We weren't Jews. God had come down and given to an entire people his word. A, an incredible thing that the Jew had. So he boasted over, over that when he looked at his Gentile counterpart. He said, you have nothing. We have the law. Oh, they thought there was something else. They relied on the law. And had God chosen any other people to reveal himself at Mount Sinai? No. Their religious reverence for the law betrayed the hope that put, they put in their possession of it. The Jew, look at what he did. He boasted about knowing the one true God. He bragged about his relationship to God. And their law was a far cry from the Gentile who only had idols of wood and stone. Israel's God was their father. Look at what it says in Micah chapter 3. Verse 11 says this. The hands thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? Not evil can come upon us. Oh, they really thought that. They thought that when they looked at a Gentile, that there was nothing that could ever come upon them. Because they had God. They had something. We had absolutely nothing as Gentiles. He prided himself about knowing the will of God as it is revealed in the Old Testament, and he consented to it. Or as Paul put it, he 
he approveth the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. Israel could, it is true, say that they knew the will of God because with the revelation of the law, they were instructed at least this on what God's will was. We had nothing. We didn't, the Torah wasn't given to us. It wasn't given to Gentile nations. They were the ones with special revelation of God as children of God. Look at what it says in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22. He says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. They were God's children. They were the Jews. They were chosen. You know what they were? They were the apple of his eye. Look at what it says in Zechariah 2. It says, For thus, thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory, he sent me unto the nations which spoiled for you, spoiled you, for that he toucheth you, you toucheth the apple of his eye. For he that toucheth you. He said this, if you touch a Jew, Jews could, Gentiles could, you better not mess with a Jew. <laughs> Because God said they're my people. Mm -hmm. And you have no right to, to, to even touch them. He says, if you bless them, I'll bless you. But if you curse them, I'll curse you. Mess with a Jew. He said, mess with them. They're mine. They're my people. They were instructed out of the law. He possessed the truth. He had the law of God. And what he had was a possession so rich, so magnificent, that it transcended the greatest insights and wisdom of even the highest periods of classical Greek culture. Wow. Greek mythology paled in comparison to the revelation from God himself to the Jewish people. At best, the only thing that a Greek could do was come up with gods and goddesses to worship, which led to idolatrous worship. They did not have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So you know what they did? They came up with their gods. They just made them up. They came up with, with someone. They did. Moses had more wisdom than Plato. Jeremiah had more truth than Aristotle. Amos understood righteousness more than Socrates. The best that the Greek could offer was nothing in comparison to the Old Testament prophets of God who had been revealed the truth of God from God himself. That's right. That's right. The, this was not because these men had better minds or were by nature more acute thinkers. You know what it was because? It was because the grace of God and because God didn't go back on his promises. God promised to Abraham that he would make a nation out of them. He looked out, looked for a man. He found a man named Abraham and he said, Abraham, from you, I'm going to make you a great people. And you know what? They started screwing up from that point on. But you know what God didn't do? He didn't go back on his word. No, Because he never goes back on his word. He never, ever, ever goes back on his word. He promised them that he would make them a great nation. And you know what? Today, people hate Jews. Yes, they do. They hate them. And you know what? If you look at them from the outside looking in, they've done nothing to deserve what they get. But here's, here's a difference. It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with the fact that God doesn't go back on his promises. He will not go back on his promises. He promised it. He said he would do it. He won't. He's not, as we, this may not be politically correct, he's not an Indian giver. That's right. That's right. Well, that's right. He doesn't give it and take it back at all. He is God, and he promised them that he would do what he said he would do. You know what else a Jew had? He had an advantage because of his Hebrew birth. Yeah. It wasn't just his religion. It wasn't just that he received the law. It was his birth itself that made him special. How? Because from a child, a Jew had the opportunity to be taught in the synagogue. You know what Greeks had? They had pagan temples. 
and, and, and they had a bunch of wooden gods up in them. It was a mess. They had nothing to worship. They had nothing that would, could even speak to them. He was made to revere and keep the Sabbath. He was made aware of his need of a sacrifice early in life. And he was indoctrinated in the truth of separation. His birthright was a birthright that had set him apart from any other nation and people on the entire face of the earth. He had the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. God said, you are my people. We never, we didn't have that as Gentiles. Now, we're going to move on in this. We go, oh, because God did change. Praise the Lord, he changed that up. Amen. 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 But it wasn't that way initially. This, against those who were in, instead were pagans, who had been steeped in idolatry and superstition, this against the Gentiles, who the scripture says knew not God, who were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, who were strangers from the covenants of promise, and the scripture says this, Gentiles who had no hope and was without God in the world. That was us. Yeah. Let me tell you something. What we had. Amen. Amen. I wasn't going to go there yet. Thank you. Because I want to focus on the Jew right now. God gave us something special. Yes, he did. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Unlike the Gentile. The Jew had the advantage of being a Hebrew by birth. He had the advantage of having the most covenant of items. You know what he had? He had a Hebrew Bible. Oh. He was instructed out of the law. He had something that at least let him know what was said. Now, he talked about the Gentile who he's still giving us a conscience, right? So that we, in our conscience, still know what's right and wrong. But the Jew, he had a written law. Yes, he did. God had revealed himself to this people as he had no other people on this earth. But here was the problem. They were wrong in supposing that the privileges that they had, by their birth and by the law, had exempted them from the judgment of God. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, that's right. God had, they, they felt that they didn't have to keep his commandments. And they didn't have to keep his law. They thought that just because they had them, that was good enough. You know what? The scripture talks about a person that compares himself among himself and he's not wise. You know what the Jews' problem? He was comparing himself to the wrong thing. Uh -huh. That's where he made a mistake. God had already warned them this in Amos chapter 3, in verse 2. It says, uh, Wanda, we're maybe ahead here. Yeah, there we go. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. But here's what they failed to realize. Mm. He says, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquity. Mm. He said, here's the problem, Jew. You think you're special? You are. You think I've chosen you? I did. You think I've given you the law? I have. You think I've given you your Hebrew Bible? Here it is. Here's your problem, though. That causes you to call, fall under a greater condemnation because you have something that they don't have and you don't obey it. The Jews had already been made to understand that with increased privilege came increased responsibility. Their problem was that they thought that increased privilege meant exoneration from the judgment of God. God had revealed himself to the Jew in a very special way. And for that reason, the Jew had the advantage from birth. And this is what it is. He was confident of this truth. Confident of this truth. The word confident goes in your blank. Because as we move to verse 19, he says this. He says, and I'm confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, 
an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law. Now, what Paul then he uses here is a bit of sarcasm. Paul, and if you want, if you read Paul's writing, Paul was, was, was somewhat yes. sarcastic. Yes, 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 okay. yes. You can tell his writing because Paul yeah. always used, kind of like Big Jim does, very <laughs> He used sarcasm in his writings. And he used it to get his point across. In other words, this is what Paul was saying. Paul was saying that the Jew had set himself up as a teacher of others and did so with contemptuous pride and with deep scorn from the, for the ignorance of others. And what happened was this. They fell into the lie that many great people had fallen into who failed to give God the glory for all that, they have, that he has given to them and instead become prideful and arrogant and self-centered. You know what? Our church has a danger of doing that. Really. You have to be careful with some of the information that I give you. And some of you have probably experienced sitting among in a group. You, you're sitting there knowing, yeah, this is what you either say. And I know it, because I've done it, been there, done that, got the tape, t-shirt, the whole nine yards, right? <laughs> right? You sit there going, I know this or that. And if they say something that you know is wrong, you immediately go, huh, he didn't even know what he's talking about. Right. We have to be careful of that. Mm -hmm. All right? Because mm -hmm. we're giving you information, and we're trying to bring you to a higher place. Only understand this. The information that you get is not for you to have be prideful and arrogant with it. Okay? It's not for you to be puffed up with knowledge. Because here's your problem. To whom much is given... Right? So that's, that's your issue. The Jews look with infinite disdain at the Gentile neighbor for their abysmal ignorance of even the first principles of matters made so clear to the most illiterate Jew who had at least the law. They were snobs towards the Gentiles because they had access to a truth that no Gentile had access to. For that reason, Paul sends down an indictment against the Jew. The problem was that the Jew, having rejected their Messiah, had to alibi their rejection of the scriptures that prophesied his first coming. I want you to think about something, right? He's got the law. He got his hand, is giving it to him in his hand. He's giving him everything that he knows that he should know. Primarily this that the Lord is coming. The Jew should have known it. He had a book that told him that. He had scrolls that let him know that there was a Jewish Messiah come. All he had to do was read Isaiah. So when he came, there was no reason for them to reject him because they knew he was right. coming. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. See, yes. they had every reason to know. Hear me now, because we're no different. Because now he's getting ready to come again. Come on now. That's right. And we have no reason to, to, to reject him or reject his coming or not know that he's coming. If he catches you as a thief of the night, hear me now, don't take this personal. That's your fault. That's right. Yes, it is. You have everything that you need yep. to know that he's coming. Yes. Yes, we do. Absolutely. We're all going to stand before him in judgment. What you do with your time? What you do with it, choice is yours. You get 24 hours in a day. Choose this day. Yeah, cool. Whom you yeah. You choose. You get a choice every day on how you spend your 24. Yeah. And hear me. You're going to stand accountable for what you did with it. You get 24. You get 24 till they add up to 70 years. Then after that, if you get more, 
Hallelujah. Right? If you can happen to get more than 70, it's great. But you get 70. Most of us haven't reached there yet. So God, His mercy is giving you another bet. Thank you. The question is, what are you going to do with your time tomorrow? The choice is yours. Because you're going to stand accountable for it. The Jew had rejected him. They rejected their Messiah. So what they did was that. They had to have an alibi for their rejection of his first coming. So what they did was this. They reinterpreted the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament so that they weren't prophecies at all. To them had been given the oracles of God for the purpose of bringing salvation to the Gentile world. God said this, I am going to choose out a people and I'm going to give them the law. I'm going to give them a Hebrew Bible. I'm going to give them all of the teachers of the law. I'm going to give them the synagogue. I'm going to give them everything that they need, right? And then of them, what I'm going to do is then use them to take to Gentile nations. Right? That's why it says this in John chapter 4. This is Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. He says, Jesus said unto her woman, Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Why? Ye worship, ye know not what. We, we know what we worship. And then he says this, For salvation is of the Jews. The Jews have been given the charge of bringing salvation to us. They could, they had everything. They knew he was coming. They had everything that the, the, the be instructors of us. Instead, they looked at us with disdain. They looked down their noses at us instead of being an instructor of us, which was given their, their charge. That's what they were given the charge of. Three different times in Ezekiel, he recounts how God had not judged Israel when they came to Egypt for the purpose of keeping here. Here's why he didn't do it. Right? He promised to Abraham that he would, he would have a people. Right? And I'm, I'm, I just read all this this week. It was my weekly reading, right? Where Joseph goes down into to Egypt, right? And he goes down into Egypt and, and, and they, they had no idea that they were going to use Joseph to be the people who was a part of the original establishment of the nation of Israel, right? Because they were established in Egypt, right? So they bring, so they go down in the Egypt, and he he brings them to this place where they had the responsibility of taking the name of the Lord, which they were told to not take in vain. See, we think of taking the name of the Lord about you cussing, you taking the name of that what not what it means. You know what will you do? You've been given the name Christian. You know what God said? Don't take my name in vain. He told the Jews, You've taken my name, you are my sons. Don't take my name in vain. Their problem? was that they took his name in vain. One of the reasons he didn't want his name taken in vain is because he didn't want Gentiles, he didn't want heathens to then have a disdain for God because of the Jew. So this is what he said in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 9. He says this. He says, but I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen yeah. among whom they were in whose sight I made myself known unto them in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. He said, I didn't bring you out to pollute my name. I didn't bring you out. I didn't bring you through, through the flesh pots of Egypt. I didn't bring you from under the thumb of Pharaoh. I didn't bring you from the places that I brought you from. Only for you to take my name and take it in vain and pollute it. But for the heathen, though they deserve judgment, 
You know what God did? He withheld his judgment and patiently tried to teach them his ways so that the surrounding nations would not ridicule his name because of his people. Finally, God's patience ran out and what he did was send them into exile under the thumb of Gentile nations and Gentile kings. You can read that in Kings and Chronicles. And as a result, his name was in fact blasphemed anyway by Gentile nations. Look at what it says in Ezekiel 36. It says, and when they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, why? Because they got kicked out of their land. Look at what they did. They profaned my holy name when they said unto them, These are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for mine holy name, God says, which the house of Israel, watch this, had profaned among the heathen whither they went. Mm. Mm. Harry, you know what God has done? He's given us his name. Yes. We are his children. That's yeah. right. Right? You know what's a tragedy? When we have a, a worse testimony than, than the people we work with. That's, right. That's, That's right. right. You're right. Hallelujah. Who don't profess to be Christians. Who will tell you, I'm an atheist, yet they'll go and, and have a better name at work than you do. You're the one stealing time, won't give eight hours work for eight hours pay. You're the one who, who sometimes goes in and, and the boss has to wake you up at the cubicle. See. <laughs> you know what we do? We end up profaning his name. Right, that's right. Yeah. Right. His name becomes a cuss word. No wonder people ain't coming to Christ. Right. They're not coming to Christ in some cases because of us. That's what I said. That's right. It's true. We're not leading people to Christ because we couldn't. If we walked up to some of us, and I'm, I'm putting myself in this category, you know, I'm gone. But if some of us walked up to some of our co-workers and said, can I tell you about the Lord? They'd go sit back and go, you? What you gonna tell me about what? You forget that I saw you. You forget what you do? What do you mean? You don't tell me about your God? Why don't you worship him? You want me to worship him? Why don't you? And I'm not saying that all of us are perfect. I'm not saying that all of us don't make mistakes. I'm not saying that all of us don't blow our testimony every now and then. Can I get an amen? amen. Right? Amen. Some of us blow it. Amen. Right? But the difference is, is that your lifestyle? Then on Sunday, it's hallelujah. Right? That's what the Jews' problem was. That they were supposed to be leading the heathen into salvation. And they looked at them and thought, you can't tell us anything, Jew. It was a mess. So here's the thing. There was an accountability to the truth because of this reason. There was spiritual insincerity. Look at what it says in the first part of verse 21. It says, thou therefore that teaches another. He said, teachest thou not thyself? Wow. He said, when you teach another person, do you, do, do you teach yourself? What a sad thing to have been given the privilege to be God's chosen people, yet the, their behavior and their privileged position, when it should have produced something good, it was not themselves how they lived. They taught others, but they didn't teach themselves. The idea is this, that just because you have the Ten Commandments or even teach them to others doesn't mean that you are absolved of anything. The Jews had the law. The Jews had the commandments. But the Jew had the responsibility to be a teacher of that which had been committed unto him. The issue was not what he had, but what impact did it have on him? We can be teachers of the law. But if you're not a doer of the law, you got a problem. <clears throat> Do we adhere to that which we instruct? Living out the principles 
that you teach should be the goal of not just every teacher of the oracles of God, but every professed believer as well. The teacher must apply his precepts to himself before he can apply them to other people. You know, it's, it's hear me, because it's like in discipleship, right? And some of you know where I stand on this. Sometimes we make mistakes in, in discipleship, right? And I'm trying to learn from the mistakes that I made. But here's the thing. Hear me now. You can't teach discipleship. There are four goals, right? To establish the disciple. And what's the first one? Huh? And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and it's, it's in the Word of God, right? Establish them. Huh? In the, church. in the local church, right? In the fellowship of other believers, right? And then in ministry. You can't teach someone something that you don't do. What's right? See, there's, there, there, there's, there's less intent. It's on giving, right? You can't teach somebody on giving if you don't give it. Right? You can't teach someone in some principle that you're not willing to do yourself. Amen. Yep. It's just that simple, right? What do we tell our children? Do as I say, not as I do. You, you can't do that in discipleship. You can't do that. Discipleship is very serious. That's why I'm very cautious about who I, who I let allow to disciple people, right? Because if you're not living it, you're never going to teach it. you got to come up with an excuse for it. Yeah. It's just that simple. That's what the Jews were doing. He said, well, you teach other people, you don't even do it. <laughs> that was their problem. God gave us his word. He gave us the example of the Jew so that we would not make the same mistake. Unfortunately, there are many Christians that do it who, unlike a lost man, have the word of God. We have the instruction of God. And we, and we too, have teachers who can instruct us in the oracles of God. Yet, we still profane his name. Why? Because of our rejection of his truth and we don't do what we say that we're supposed to do. Here's the second thing. There was spiritual insensitivity. He said this in the second part of verse 21 and verse 22. He said, thou that preachest a man should not steal. Does thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery. Does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhors idol, dost thou commit sacrilege? Here was the Jews' problem. They preached against stealing, yet they were thieves. <laughs> they preached against adultery, but they committed adultery themselves. They abhorred idols, but they went in and stole from the pagan temples. This, there is a saying, do as I say, not as I do. You know what, that's self-righteous. Christians can get just as bad concerning their self-righteous attitude as the Jews were. Yep. There are Christians who judge others for the same thing that they are guilty of. Yep. <clears throat> it's easy to preach to others yet be guilty of doing that which we preach against. It's a danger that Paul knows possible. Look at what he said to the church at Corinth. Speaking of himself, he said, I'm therefore so wrong. He said, I'm going to use myself as an example. He says, not as uncertain to you. So I fight, so fight I, he says, not as one that beateth the air. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection. Why? Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Amen. There's always a danger of preaching to others and being guilty of the very thing that you're telling people not to do. God has entrusted us with what Paul calls the mysteries of God. He said that we as believers in the Lord are to be stewards. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Do you know what that means? Hear me now. I'm going to get ready to speak to some of you. <laughs> How many mysteries are there in the scriptures? Seven. In the New Testament church? Who can name it? And don't raise it. 
All I'm here to tell you is this. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be stewards over. There's seven of them. But you can't be a steward over something you don't even know. If you don't know what the mysteries are, how can you be a steward over it? Well. Now hear me then. Whenever you've been given stewardship of something, that means that you're held accountable for it. If you don't know what the mysteries are, you know what? I teach them. I make sure that they You know what? You know why I teach them? Because I don't want to stand before God and God say, God, Ray, you was the steward over the stewards, and you were supposed to be teaching them stewardship, and you didn't even teach them what they were supposed to be stewards over. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lose reward because of any of you. <laughs> I'm not. I am not willing to lose an ounce of reward because of you. So you know what? I'm going to give it. If you don't show up to get it, it ain't going to be on me. I'm making sure that I give you what I'm supposed to be giving you. Here's the deal. Don't come. And when you stand before the Lord, you know what he's going to say? Door number one. Door number two, uh, door number three. And let me tell you what's behind them. And here's the thing. If you don't know what's behind them, you could have known. Amen. You didn't want to miss the blacklist. Y'all know what the blacklist is. Come on, man. You didn't want to miss scandal. <laughs> I even gave you DVR. <laughs> you could have DVR'd it, watched it later, but you didn't want to come because you thought I might miss something. You was busy sleep. That's why you don't know the mysteries. Now, come before me and let me judge you according to them. Oh, what? You don't know what was going to be on the test? What do you mean you don't know what was going to be on the test? I gave you all the instruction that you needed to learn what was going to be on the test. Why don't you know that? And not only that, you were supposed to be teaching them to other people. What do you mean you taught them to know one? What did, what, what, say it again. You didn't know one? Why not? I even put you in a church that they was teaching it. You took absolutely no advantage of it. Choice is yours. Come up before me. Come on. Let's judge you. <laughs> and you know what? According to the scripture, some of us are going away, gonna, gonna stand before in the judge in, in, in the kingdom, naked and ashamed. Yeah. You know why we're gonna be naked and ashamed? Because we spent our 70 years. Partying, man. We was living the Epicurean lifestyle. <laughs> Seeking pleasure. So here's my question. How's your stewardship going these days? Do you even know what the mysteries are? How can you be a faithful steward over something that you don't even know? Do you not know that God is going to judge your stewardship? Do you not know that God is giving you every opportunity to learn what those mysteries are so that when you stand before him and are judged from, for your faithfulness over those mysteries, you should be able to stand righteous. The third point is this. There's a spiritual insolvency. It says this in the last two verses. He says, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The Jews bragged about having the law. The problem is that they dishonor God by breaking it themselves. What good is a law if you're not going to hold it? Right? What good if the Kansas City, Missouri, right, the people say, okay, on I-70, we're going to make the, and, and it drives me crazy when I see it, right? You ever seen a cop that just runs through lights? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And he don't even put his lights on. Woo, 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 woo. And he's going through lights. Right. He going away. And that's too, right? There's a law that says you're not supposed to break the law. But yet they break the law and then have the authority <laughs> to ticket us for breaking the very law that they break. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, I'm, I'm not against cops. I love cops. Praise the Lord for cops. Amen. Romans 13 lets us know Amen. why there are cops. Amen. Okay? Right? They, they, God placed them in church. Praise the Lord for police. But there's some crooked ones. Thank you. Let me put this on tape. There's some crooked ones. <laughs> right? And the problem is when they're telling us to keep a law that they themselves break. Okay? What a tragedy of the Jew to brag about the fact that God had given them the law of God to boast of their heritage and Jewishness and revelation of God's law that had been given to them, yet in their own personal lives, they themselves dishonored God by breaking the very law that they boasted of. It reminds me of people that brag about their church. Oh, they brag about their pastor. They brag on Facebook about their relationship with God. And they always seem to put some spiritual post on there. Yet, if you watch them closely, it's not hard to see that they dishonor God in their own personal life. I see it every day. You see, that's a, the one thing about social media. You can hide behind social media. You know what we call it? Lip service. God is not looking for people that honor God publicly, but dishonor him privately. The proof and integrity of your ministry is what God happens, is what happens when no one is looking. The proof of your love for God is when you're faced with adversity, how do you handle it? Well, Come on, man. Right. The proof of your study of God's word is living out the principles of God's word in your own personal life. You can't brag about God, yet dishonor God by living in disobedience to his word. You can't do it. I've had couples in here, and they know where I stand on it, right? It's all right for you to live together for a minute, but I'm saying something. And I'm going to make you get mad. And I'm not saying that people don't go out and entertain themselves. But if you're living in fornication, if you're living in adultery, and you, you, let me tell you something. Hear me. Don't take this personal. I'm getting in your business. Be mad at me. Ain't none of your business what I do. You, you know what? You'll do absolutely nothing here. That's right. And God really can't use you until you're ready to give up your life. Thank you. That's right. Lose yes. it. Yes. Yep. He can't use you until you're ready to give it up. Hear me now. That don't mean that you're going to be successful in all points. You know, but God gives grace and mercy, and his mercy endures forever. He's good. That's what he did with the nation of Israel, right? Hear me now. All that they did, he's still going to bring them through the tribulation so he can still give them the land that he promised Abraham. Right. But you know what? God holds us accountable. And we need to hold each other. You know why we don't hold each other accountable? Because in most cases, we can't. Because how are you going to say something to somebody what you're doing? It's the only time that you can't hold people accountable. Because you're looking at them telling them you shouldn't be doing that. And you're doing it. Now all of us, hear me now, all of us got things that we're working through in life. Amen? Amen. All of us are working through stuff. So I'm going to give you, I don't want you to walk out here feeling bad. Because all of us have things that we're working through. Some of us are much more mature than others. That's all. Some of us still got some growing to do. Amen? Mm -hmm. yes. Hallelujah? Amen. <laughs> some of us, I mean, it's okay. But if you still, this time next year, got the same issue year after year after year after year. You know what's the first thing I do? Because people come to me, oh, Pastor, let me talk to you. I want you to get you. You got a minute? Oh, absolutely. Come on, baby. Let's talk. And in my head, I'm going, how often do I see him here? How often do I see him involved in the things of God? Do they have an excuse every time you turn around? Are they involved in the things of God? Can I trust them to be discipling someone? What are they doing in their life? You know, I look at it and say, you know, sometimes I really want to stop and say, can, can I just give you a little panorama of who you are here? Why do you think that you're going to be the spiritual giant when you've done nothing?
thing to, to get yourself there. Yeah. This takes a little bit of work. We don't do, sometimes I think we think we have this missed thing that we get saved and everything's just going to fall in the line. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. You got to give yourself over. You got to give up some stuff. And give yourself over to be, te to be taught, to be instructed. You know the scripture talks about a man who forsakes instruction? God doesn't like when you forsake his instruction. And then you, we worry about, why am I still struggling in this area? I got so many problems. <sighs> Isaiah 52, 5 says this. He says to the Jews, he says, Now therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them, make them to how, saith the Lord? And my name continually, every day, is blasphemy. The Gentiles saw that the Jews, what they did in verses 21 and 23, and they, they kicked and ridiculed the Jews and the scriptures and their God. And the Old Testament example of, of this was when David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then he had her husband murdered. Nathan the prophet said this in 2 Samuel 12, 14. He says, by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme. Because you didn't do what's right. So in conclusion, this is what God is doing. God is looking for people that obey the law, not people who only boast of the law. The problem with the Jew was that they did not obey that which they boasted of having. When we demonstrate a lack of power in the Lord, then the name of the Lord is what gets trashed by people. We may think that our lack of faith and trust in the word of God has no impact on others, but the reality is that God is the one that ends up being blasphemed by lost people. Why? Because of our sin. If it weren't for Christians, we might actually reach some lost people. Hear what I say? If it weren't for Christians, we might actually reach lost people. But the, instead, sometimes, then it because of us, right? Amen. The name of the Lord is blasphemy. Amen. True. Because of what we do. It's a tragedy. And you know what? Here's my challenge to you. It's only a day at a time. Just try to walk to tomorrow. What the purpose in your heart that tomorrow I'm going to get up, right? And before, like I normally get up at 7, I'm going to get up at 6.30 tomorrow. I'm going to give God that half hour. And I'm going to give my time to God, and I'm going to get in his word. And I don't know what I'm reading. I don't even get it. It is Greek to me. But just read it. Amen. Just find something and start reading, right? And I told you this. There's, there's 31 days normally in a month. There's 31 Proverbs. Read the Proverbs. What's tomorrow? The what? What's tomorrow's day? 20th. 20th. The 20th, right? Go read Proverbs chapter 20 tomorrow. <laughs> start there, right? Just read something. And you know what? God is not looking at what you read. He's looking at the fact that you thought enough of him. That you would get up a half hour early just to get in his word. Amen. That you cared that much about him. Just think if your child got up a half hour early to make you breakfast. And they ain't burnt the breakfast. Right? And the eggs was nasty. Right? And, 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 the, and, and the, uh, the pancakes still had shells in them. <laughs> right? You wouldn't necessarily look at it and think, well, that's a bad thing. You would think, you know what, praise the Lord, my child cared enough about me that they actually got up and tried to make me some breakfast. And you'd actually probably eat a bite or two of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Crunch on an eggshell or here and there. Right? But you would care. That's how God thinks of us. Amen. The fact that you just care about him. Amen. You know why? Because he gave his life for you. Amen. And the fact that you would even actually, you know, that's why uh, we have church here, even if it snows crazy. You know why? Because I think, you know what? He came from heaven to earth. Amen. Amen. That's right. Can I make it the, the, the whole however many miles from here to there? And, and I can make it. Can I not give him something? Can I give him something? You know? He's 
worthy. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Me and me and uh, Miss Tom Thomas talk about this all the time. I think sometimes, Miss Thomas, sometimes I think that when you have come, when God has really brought you through something. You have a love for God that other people sometimes don't understand. Hallelujah. That's right. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Right. yes. Yeah. That's right. Some of you know my testimony. Most of you don't. But God has brought me through something. Yes. Yes. I got saved. Past tense. He saved me. Thank you. And you know what? I can give him some of my time. Actually, I, I, my heart is dedicated to give my life to him. That's right. Because, see, I realize that this thing is only but for a moment. Right. We only got a little time. Right. Here's our problem. You know, we don't understand it. I'm done. We don't understand eternity. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. See, we don't realize that in this little yeah. short time, yeah. we get a window to give what we can to him, and then we get to reap it forever uh -huh. and ever uh -huh. and uh -huh. ever and ever. Our yeah. problem is that we don't understand ever and ever right. and ever, because everything we know has beginning and end. Yeah. Right. right? So we only see within our realm. Here's the deal. God gives you 70 years on this earth. Give him what you got. If you didn't get saved till late, you spent most of it living for yourself. That's enough. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Right? Give him something now. Yeah. Give him whatever time you got, and you'll, you'll reap forever. Amen. You'll reap forever. We give our, we give our boss some overtime. Trust me. And we get a little bitty paycheck and then Uncle Sam take half of that. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> yes, he does. Both and so. God says, just give me something. And I'm telling you, I'll give you a hundredfold. Yes, he will. I'm a witness. Amen. 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 And that's all he's asking. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you.